COP26 conference on climate change in Glasgow is gradually winding down. African countries, including Nigeria, have made a series of technical group presentations. In this edition of the program, we will be bringing you our second series of the events in Glasgow. And of course, other developmental stories across the continent are in the menu. I am Charles Alpha, welcoming you to Africa Weekly. Now, Nigeria is reassuring stakeholders of her commitment to reduce greenhouse emissions by 47% by the year 2030. The outline of achieving this were laid out at one of the numerous presentations at the COP26 conference. Air pollution from black carbon, dump sites, soot from factories and methane from oil and gas production affect 92% of people worldwide. Reducing short-lived climate pollutants like black carbon, methane and hydrofluorocarbons can have a dramatic impact on the climate by saving 2.5 million lives a year, cutting global crop losses by 50 million tons and cutting climate change by half a degree Celsius. The United Nations Climate and Clean Air Coalition high-level ministerial meeting at COP26 is therefore organized to review solutions and upskill more action for clean air. That we're currently at about 1.8 degrees if everybody were to do everything that they have said. That just tells us 1.5 is possible. The global methane assessment shows that cutting methane emissions by 45% by 2030 would make 1.5 possible. Nigeria has been a partner in the Clean Air Coalition since 2012 and has developed a national action plan to reduce short-lived climate pollutants. In Nigeria's updated NDC, we have committed to 60% reduction in figurative Metal emissions from our oil and gas operations by 2031. The overall target is to achieve clean air through improved commitments to sustainable transport, clean energy, waste management, methane recapture, monitoring industries to reduce leaks in the production of fossil fuels and promoting sustainable agriculture. Nigeria has presented its Gender Action Plan on Climate Change to the United Nations Climate Conference COP26 in Glasgow as a show of the nation's commitment to promoting equality in its nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement. To deal with the effects of climate change and to take climate action. So equality cannot be a casualty of climate. And that means we need deeds, not words. We need action on gender cutting across our work to reduce emissions, to protect communities, and build resilience. So we must empower women and girls and support them to create the change. Nigeria's commitment to gender equality in climate action is embedded in the Gender Action Plan Implementation Strategy, which has provision for budget and prompt release of funds. Nigeria's new commitment will enhance the participation of women in local communities in forestry and agriculture related climate actions in the country. The goal of the action plan is to ensure that national climate change processes in Nigeria mainstream gender considerations to guarantee inclusiveness of all required. This doc the document will serve as a guide into climate change and challenges to women. The commitment also covers climate smart waste management and gender-based programs for integrated water resources management. In continuation of our analysis of the African perspective at COP26 conference, 
We are engaging one of the AU delegates, Dr. Twinji Asawalu from Glasgow via Zoom. Dr. We're glad to have you once again on Africa Weekly. How is Glasgow? Uh, Glasgow is fine. Thank you for having me. It's good to connect with you here. All right. Now, in your own opinion, what has transpired so far at the COP26 conference? Uh, thank you very much. I think the little that I can gather here is um, the world leader that I've met and uh, they have discussed of the, uh, of the next phase to the climate change. This is the first time that um, the global leaders will be gathering together to be talking on the next step of actions after the advent of the COVID-19. Uh, I think uh, basically they have, come, uh, they have coming out with a lot of strategies as regards to how they can, um, uh, especially on the area of financing mechanism uh, on the, uh, towards the adaptation of the climate change. Yeah. If you also listen to the statements and the presentations of uh, uh, President Mohamed Ubari speaking on behalf of the Nigerians and on behalf of the African leader, he clearly emphasized that uh, the African as a whole had been seated, had been lied to, especially when it comes to you know, the issue of an agreement that uh, the developed country have also pledged towards the developing country. And at the end of the day, that's most of those agreements is not being um, uh, coming to fulfillment. Uh, our president really emphasized on this, that it's high time that uh, the world leaders to speak and of course to be backing their speak, their talk with actors. Okay, now I, I need you to weigh in on these. Now, Nigerian representatives at some of the group events have made presentation on technical and financial assistance on accelerated issues of desertification mm -hmm. and drought, you know, that affecting agricultural activities in the north. Yeah, yes, I think, uh, I think Nigeria, Nigeria need, uh, it need this uh, more, uh, more, even more than any, any other country because where, where, where Mr. President emphasized on this, you actually know what he's actually talking about. I think if Mr. President is making for that plea that uh, the global state to look into the in, into Nigeria to see how we can also you know get an assistance, I think it will also go a long way to also help the the national contributions of uh, for development. So okay. we need finance to tackle these areas. The certification we need finance. The, the flood area we need finance, even the erosions and pollution we need finance, even to also transit from the first uh, point, even to the uh, adaptation to the, uh, the reducing the emotions to move from the energy side, we need finance. And in Nigeria at the moment, when we look at the Nigeria at the moment, you see the challenge, energy challenges. So for us to also transit from that energy side, the Nigeria need the more of that support. I think if this could be what Nigeria will get away, from this uh, COP26, I think it will go a long way in helping the development. Uh, finally, in what area do you think Africa should focus on in attracting assistance at the conference? Yeah, so that is what we just talked about. The Africa that say, oh, I think they have uh, similar challenges and uh, um, um, their challenges are equal or similar when you look at, uh, when you look at us across Africa. The, the same that certifications that are all there, where you go to the other part of the Africa, they face the same, the, the, the same similar challenges. I think our Africa needs to also come together and speak into one voice. And uh, uh, for, uh, for us to also, you know, achieve the Agenda 2063, which is Agenda for the Development, whereby we want to see it was porous Africa that based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. We need energy, because without energy, we can't talk about industrialization. So we, uh, uh, our leaders in Africa need to place this as, as a matter of a first priority. All right. Thank you, Doctor, for sharing with us your thoughts from Glasgow. Thank you very much. All right. Now, up next is Titbit segment. Please do stay with us.
Nigeria is inviting the French business community to take advantage of the vast potential available in the largest economy in Africa. Let's hear from President Mohamed Buhari. The International Partnership Forum put together by the Nigerian government to leverage on the Paris Peace Summit seeks to, amongst others, bring a special spotlight on Africa's largest economy in Europe on matters of security, economy and development. The idea is post-COVID, what are the opportunities and how can we promote investment in our country and how do we clear the cobweb of misunderstanding especially of matters of security. We have done so much and so well, you know, averting these dangers. People need to be reassured that the climate itself is good enough for investors to come. I thought we were left alone, but what I have heard and seen today, it appears that uh, there is a great attention in what is happening. And if once we're able to acknowledge that there is a problem, then a solution is coming soon especially when it comes to using technology to address our security challenges. And I believe with the efforts of the federal government, very soon uh, most of these challenges will be addressed. The high-level engagement had in attendance French and Nigerian government officials as well as key players in the diplomatic, business and economic enterprises of the two countries and beyond. President Muhammad Buhari thanked participants to what he called the well-intentioned initiative for their sustained faith in Nigeria, confidence in the government, and significant contributions to the nation's economic prospects. France-Nigeria bilateral relations are currently at their best. Our administration has capitalized on the strong political and economic ties between both countries to deepen trade relations, retaining Nigeria as France's biggest trading partner in sub-Saharan Africa. I believe that the robust bilateral engagement fits into the French plan to reset and rebalance its foreign policy framework in Africa for sustainable and mutually beneficial partnership. He said if anything ever tested multilateralism and signaled the poor state of international cooperation, it was the absence of a viable global plan for tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. For Nigeria, the president, however, said apart from redoubling efforts towards mitigating its socio-economic effects, various reform measures have also been introduced to place the economy on the path of sustainable growth. These include establishing the Infrastructure Cooperation of Nigeria, Infraco, signing into law the Petroleum Industry Act, launching the electronic version of the national currency, the e Naira, and improving the national policy on fifth generation 5G network. Let me finally stress that Nigeria is open for partnership and cooperation. As our development partners, Rest assured that we will stand together with you throughout our partnership journey to guarantee our mutual interest. I can assure you that our administration is on the right path to achieving multi-sectoral progress. We have revitalized the economy by increasing investments in capacity building, health, infrastructure, women's empowerment, climate change, and food security. Today, these actions are yielding self-employment, expanding our human resource pool, and strengthening our national productivity for sustainable development. Now, Gabon and Morocco have finalized modalities to establish a commission to facilitate trade and relations between both countries. Gabon's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mobele Mobeya, on Friday highlighted the imminent holding of the Great Moroccan Gabonese Joint Commission. The head of Gabonese diplomacy stressed during a press briefing following his talks with Morocco's Minister of Foreign Affairs, African Cooperation and Moroccans abroad, 
Nessa Borita the importance of further strengthening bilateral relations, focusing in particular on economic and trade development. According to him, these talks were an opportunity to invite Moroccan businessmen to settle in Gabon and share their expertise. He added that he and Borita discussed several regional and international issues of common interest. <laughs> ECOWAS. A new framework on security and governance for member countries have been launched in Abuja, Nigeria. The history of most West African countries has been linked to social unrest, giving rise to political instability and economic crises. These developments are bringing state and non-state actors on the round table to brainstorm on the future of the region under bilateral cooperation. The objective of the ECOWAS SSRG policy framework, which are to promote common security standards in the region, complement nationally-led initiatives, and promote regional security coordination and cooperation, so as to effectively tackle new and emerging security challenges. The joint effort is to assist in the implementation of the framework for security sector reform and governance in line with best global practice. As security challenges are on the rise throughout the ECOWAS region, security institutions are more than ever in need of democratic control and oversight, as well as inclusion and respect for human rights. The German government remains committed to contributing to the creation of a secure and safe post-conflict environment in the ECOWAS region, Regional leaders promised to adopt integrated approach in finding common solutions to security threats and other challenges bedeviling ECOWAS states. We now take you to Rwanda, where that country's 50 years of relations with China have been accelerated with a sense of fulfillment. Rwanda and China collaborate in different sectors for development, namely health, education, agriculture, ICT and infrastructure, such as the expansion of the 13.8 kilometers on Atib Gahanga Akajere Highway at a cost of around 65 billion Rwandan francs and other roads as well as 200 deep water wells built in local communities across the country at a cost of more than 7 billion Rwandan francs. Honestly, this road is very useful to us because it is solving the problem of the traffic jams that used to be rampant here. These Chinese contractors are helping us to modernize the city and achieve faster development while providing employment as well because many people work here as builders with their many assistants. This is very good because the Chinese helped us to get clean water, which will help improve our social welfare and health. During a ceremony on Monday to mark the 50th anniversary of Rwandan Chinese diplomatic ties, Rwanda's Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Dr. Vincent Viruta, commended the support the People's Republic of China has provided to Rwanda over the decades. ICT, mining, air transport, education and capacity building, health, trade, tourism, agriculture, defense and security, to name a few. Since November 12, 1971, and more particularly after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, we have worked hand in hand to strategically develop our political and socio-economic ties. China currently ranks among the top largest investors in Rwanda, which has created thousands of jobs in different sectors. On his part, China's ambassador in Rwanda noted that the bilateral cooperation between both countries has been growing. Our economic and trade cooperation has got closer. China is proud to be Rwanda's largest trading partner and, and the largest project contractor. The bilateral trade volume in 2020 
reached 321 million U.S. dollars against the impact of COVID-19. A large number of infrastructure facilities that China aided and contracted to build gave strong impetus to Rwanda's economic and social development. As of the end of 2020, Chinese investments in Rwanda were worth 191 million US dollars. And still in Rwanda, a training program for senior officers who will in turn train other soldiers and personnel on international peacekeeping has commenced. The training was organized by the Rwanda Peace Academy in collaboration with the Africa branch of the British Peace Support Team and the significance of the training was emphasized by the director of the academy, retired Colonel Jiru Tarimara. <laughs> After they leave this place, apart from having the knowledge they need to serve as military observers when the need arises, they will also have the capacity to train others. That will give the RDF the capacity to use its own personnel to conduct such trainings instead of always having to source such trainers from elsewhere. And yet we have Rwandans right here that can do it. The director also commented on the sort of work military observers are expected to carry out. When we speak of observers, we must remember that they are deployed in places where treaties have been signed and those agreements are not always respected, and even atrocities may be committed. These observers are therefore supposed to collect information and submit reports so that things can be brought back on track. Officials from the British Peace Support Team have commended the level of cooperation that exists between their team and the RDF and the importance of this latest training. So the British Peace Support Team is part of the British Army uh, and we are extremely proud of the relationship we have uh, with the Rwandan Defence Forces um, and we have been supporting in many different ways whether that's been sending senior officers back to the UK to, uh, to uh, for uh, training at the Advanced Command and Staff Course, or potential young officers going back to train at our world-known Sandhurst Training Centre. But here today, uh, we are sponsoring for the UN Military Observers Course a train-the-trainer package. So building capacity in the RDF to be able to deliver this course themselves. The RDF officers being trained have also welcomed the opportunity to acquire this type of knowledge and soon be able to pass it on. The British Peace Support Team has been working with the RDF since 2013 and is based in Nairobi, Kenya. That's our package this week on Africa Weekly. Thanks for watching. I am Charles Alpha.